Good morning, Blacksburg Church. I'm very excited to worship with you today. If it's convenient for you, please stand and let's sing together our opening song. We have a risen Lord and Savior, so we will sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfurled like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us, brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. Amen. Please remain standing. Our next song is Instruments of Your Peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Where there is hatred, we will sow his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we will speak his peace to the people crying for release. We will be his instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. 
Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Where there is blindness, we will pray for sight. Where there is darkness, we will shine his light. Where there is sadness, we will bear their grief to the millions crying for release. We will be his instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Amen. Be seated. Good morning. I'm filling in for Loy because I have a special announcement to make. <clears throat> it's in the bulletin. You'll see a picture of Carolyn Moore. Today is her 90th birthday. And I think Shane said she's now one of five in our church who are 90 are older. So she's joining that decade. As soon as service is over, all who would like, please drive to her house. She's going to come out on the porch, and some of us that go will sing from her front yard. We have songs that she has given to me that she likes, and we want to sing those three songs. Robert has put them on one sheet, front and back. What we need to know is, if you're going, so while we are worshiping here, she, he's going to make copies. So can you think about that real quick? <laughs> we'll leave here, drive to Carolyn's. If you don't know where it is, follow Kay's little black uh, car. Uh, It'll be uh, parking in front of her house, beside of her house. And we'd like to have, you know, 12, 20, whatever. And um, if you plan to go, please raise your hands. Okay, hold them up. That's, Robert, can you help me look at the numbers? Okay. How many are going to Carolyn's house to sing? And couples would ride together and stand together, but we'll have distance between us <coughs> and, of course, for her. You got everything? that? Did you count me and Kay? Yeah, you got an estimate. All right. Thank you so much. This is kind of a last-minute notice, but she had an old songbook at home, and she went through it and picked out these three songs. Two are in our book. One are, is not, but... Robert has worked last night getting them together, and they'll all be on the same sheet. And I guess they could pick those up right after service if they want to carry it. They, they can, or if they don't get one, I can hand them out over there. Hand them out over there. We won't be there 15 minutes. Hope that won't interfere with your lunch plans. She's a special person. And one other person that's special is Linda Dorn. And she had you sign cards for her. And Linda has a severe migraine this morning. She just texted during class. And Linda will not be able to take that card. But I told her that I'm sure Calvin will take it a day late or two days late. Some of you, I understand, were there yesterday already been to wish her happy birthday. So let's pray for, 
for Linda. And then there's Doug and Sheila. Doug was in the hospital. He's out of the hospital on medication. His difficulties are ongoing and nothing different uh, to say about Sheila. So we have several in the Dorn family to pray for. And then Doris came in this morning uh, saying that Penny is still not able to get out. She didn't have any sleep Friday night, I think it was. And so thanks to all of you who came to uh, help clean the building last night after Leah's shower. It won't be as perfect as Penny does it, but we did the best we could. Thank you for those who helped with the cleaning because of Penny's uh, sickness. And then there was a special picture here about Weston, Weston Birch, and there's a note in uh, the bulletin about that as a picture on the bulletin board and one around the corner at the light switch and here's a picture here. So pictures say more than we could ever write or say. I like the one of Weston in the arms of the judge. I said he's already in trouble. <laughs> Not really. So look at the prayer list, and Leroy and Linda are here. I think I saw them, yeah. And they can give you an update on their granddaughter's uh, successful surgery at UVA. The tumor was benign, we understand, but there's a lot of recovery going in there. Chip had his cataract uh, surgery. It, it went back the next day. Everything. He can see much better already, but he still has to stay in and his second surgery will be this Tuesday. Uh, I think I saw Link, he's probably back there in the other room. Uh, you might want to speak to him about his mother's a serious situation in her home, uh, and he spent, was able to spend several days there. So just read through the prayer list, uh, see what Robert and Amy wrote about their niece, just a lot of serious situations that we need to pray for. On the back page of the bulletin, Jeremy, is Jeremy here? Your deadline is November 20th, and we had put in there October, so change that, November 20th, for what he's doing. There's some other things that we'll be putting in listservs. Please look at your listserv. That's the best way we have to get the word out to everyone. And uh, certainly uh, many of you are texting, and we appreciate your uh, instant, <laughs> almost instant reply to our text. Anything else? Let's have uh, Robert to come and lead prayer. Will you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank thee for the opportunity to come here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Please help us to remember the great sacrifices that have been made for us by Christ, who is willing to come forth and live that perfect life and lay down his life for us, being sinners, though we were not worthy. Father, out of gratitude, please help us to Think of things that we can do for the church, how we can serve one another in humility and in love. Please help us to look to our Lord and Savior as the great example, to focus on him, not to be distracted by the things of this world, but rather looking to Christ, submitting to his lordship, that we make proper changes and strive to do good. Please help us to look into thy word, which can teach us. Please help it to remain in our minds and our hearts, that it would change us, that it would guide our behavior, that we would listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to control our behavior when we have urges to do things that are contrary to thy will. Father, we often do sin, though, 
and our righteousness is but filthy rags. But we know that with the spirit of repentance and the willingness to change our lives, that you can forgive these things and that we can stand entire before the judgment and we can hear the words of the judge saying, not guilty, that we are righteous by the blood of the Lamb, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we make a special prayer for all those who were mentioned today that need assistance, be physically or mentally, whatever they are facing. Please give them a measure of strength and help them. Father in heaven, help us all to endure when times are difficult, uh, not returning evil for evil, but overcoming evil with good. Please strengthen us and help us. And again, help us to look to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. All these things we ask in Christ's name, amen. As we prepare to celebrate communion together, we'll sing Highest Place. We place you on the highest place, for you are the great high priest. We place you high above all else, all else, and we come to you and worship at your feet. We place you on the highest place for you are the great high priest we place you high above all else all else and we come worship at your feet, and we come to you and worship at your feet. Amen. Good morning. I just wanted to first say thank you so much for all the gifts at the shower last night. Um, I just really appreciate that and your, your love for our family. Um, so in the past uh, couple weeks, I've been really thinking about, I guess, the consumption aspect of communion, and um, I'd like to kind of compare the taking of the Lord's Supper um, to fasting just for a little bit. And this is just from my view, so you guys can examine um, for yourselves what you think kind of the difference is, maybe some of the similarities are. Um, so they're both regarding food, right? So fasting, we're you know, not consuming food, and um, Lord's Supper, we're feasting together. Um, we have examples of Jesus doing both of these things. Um, I, I tend to look at fasting as, okay, this day I'm going to try to feast on the Lord. Um, I'm going to try to think about him more, pray more, or um, tell, tell God that it's him who gives me kind of this sustenance to, to go on. Um, and in the Lord's Supper, we're, we're feeding on Jesus' body and his blood. 
Um, and I think it, that also kind of says the same thing. Our, our strength comes from, from Jesus. He, um, his sacrifice really fills our spirit um, and gives us joy. I think sometimes uh, both of these things can lead to a lot of humility. Um, and if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from Isaiah uh, chapter 58. Um, and of course, the, the Bible talks about examining ourselves. Um, and I think both fasting and the Lord's Supper can maybe lead to an over-examination of ourselves or maybe a, um, like this is the purpose that we do this to really humble ourselves and really think of all the bad things we did and just kind of pour ashes on ourselves and um, maybe make it more kind of center uh, focused. But let's, let's read from um, Isaiah. Well, actually, so I do want to talk about an experience. So last week, I actually did decide to fast. And so I'd, um, in, in preparation for this, and, and I, didn't, I didn't eat for the day, um, I felt really filled at, at first. I felt like really the connection I had with God was going to lead to, or, you know, led to me feeling filled. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to tell God today that, you know, he's going to fill me up today. Um, and so I decided to fast. But really nothing was that different besides that feeling I had in the morning. Um, and after I was done fasting, I just ate a ton. <laughs> just like a soon, man, I ate for like three straight hours just after dinner time. Uh, it just didn't stop. And okay, so then yesterday, I, you know, I was thinking, all right, I'm going to do communion tomorrow. Maybe I should fast again today, kind of, you know, get my heart um, in the right spot. And um, I decided I decided not to after reading this in Isaiah 58. So let's read there. I'll start in verse 3. It says, Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? I, I'm just going to pause there. I would have said yes to, to that. That's kind of my, what my idea of fasting would be. Like if I saw someone fasting and pouring ashes on themselves and really humbling himself, like, man, that guy can fast. All right. Um, but God continues in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke, is not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord, he will answer you shall cry, and, hear, and he'll say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And I'll just read one more verse. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And so yesterday, when I didn't fast, um, I came out and Leah had made breakfast, and it was strange. I could tell that Leah was tired and Susanna needed attention, and so I pushed off eating breakfast for a little bit. And then eventually I just microwaved something and ate it in the car as we were kind of scurrying along. So I ate breakfast late, and then at lunch... I was just enjoying fellowship with the college students and some other people, and I ended up eating lunch really late. And then at dinner, um, I ended up helping somebody change their breaks, which really just means supervising them as they did it. Um, and I ate dinner late. Um, and so I ate yesterday, but I guess my question is, which one was a true fast? Um, you know, I think the second one my love for people 
um, led to me not eating at a certain time, <laughs> you know? And that was more fulfilling to me than just not eating for a day. And I think, I think that's kind of similar to the Lord's Supper. You know, what's a, what's a Lord's Supper, Supper acceptable and pleasing to Him? Um, I don't think it's just humbling ourselves. And I think to find fulfillment, it's not necessarily just remembering Jesus and just kind of playing it back in your head all day. But I think it comes from, you know, being, being excited, being in awe that God loved us, and it's turning around and doing things for other people. And when you love those people, that's when you're going to feast on the Lord, um, and when you might not eat for a little bit. Um, and I think this is pretty consistent with the early church when they came together, you know, or even at the, when Jesus, you know, partook in the Last Supper, um, they weren't asked to come together and feel really guilty um, and just, just humble themselves, but they came together with joy. Um, and, you know, Jesus was anticipating the Last Supper. Um, and so I hope that you know, when, when we feast on the Lord together now, that it turns into action during the week and that it's still fulfilling to us during the week. Because that's, that's really the hard thing for me. It's not feeling empty during the week. Um, so let's, um, let's pray for the bread. Father, we, we love you and we come together with joy knowing that um, you sacrificed yourself for us, that you gave up your body for us. We pray that this would uh, fulfill us during the week, that, um, that we could love others. And in the same way that we're consuming you now, we just pray that our love for others would would consume a part of us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's, let's pray for the cup. Lord, we thank you again for, for loving us, for letting your love translate into the shedding of your blood. Thank you for putting us first. Thank you um, for denying yourself so many times out of, out of love for us. We know this blood, this, this cup represents your blood, Lord, and we pray that this would, um, would fulfill us during the week, Lord, through action and through our love for others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
So now we come to a separate uh, portion of our worship where um, we provide an offering for the work of the church, um, for Jesus' church. So let's pray together. Lord, you, you poured yourself out for us. You let your love for us make you want to pour yourself out for us. And we pray that, um, that this love would, would cause us to want to give of our material things um, and to give of our time, which is so, so precious, we know, to, to others. Um, I pray that we would give with a joyful heart today and not out of reluctance, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Kurt brings us the lesson today, let's stand together if it's convenient for you to do so. We'll sing A Common Love, followed by Bind Us Together. A common love for each other, a common gift. To the Savior, a common bond, holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's word. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, with bind us together with love. Amen. Be seated. I've been blessed by being here with you so far, and I'm, I'm thankful that each of you were able to make the time uh, and, and uh, make the preparations needed to be here today. Thank you so much. And for, for everybody who's worshiping with us but not here presently, we, we love you tremendously, and we're thankful for the sacrifice you're making also to take time out for, for God and for God's church. Though the people of, of Noah's day were unparalleled, in their wickedness. Was there a chance, was there a chance that God would have spared them, would have spared their lives? And more, did he want to? Did he want to spare their lives? 
And, and can, what can we learn from the Genesis flood? What, what can that tell us about the coming judgment when Jesus returns at the end of the time? Those are some of the things I want to address in this message this morning. There's tons to be learned from the history of, of Noah and his ark. But most folks just won't learn those lessons because simply they don't believe what the Bible says about it. They just don't believe such a thing happened or that it's possible or that, that, that anything like that was real. It's just a fairy tale. That's what a lot of people, even plenty of people who call themselves Christians, would say. But I wonder if you know that there are over 200 cultures around the world, somewhere close to 250 cultures around the world, that maintain narratives describing a, a great flood. And, and most of those narratives, they contain a lot of the same critical details. Not all the details are the same, but there's some critical details that, that, are, that are present in, in the majority of those. I want to mention a few of them to you. Number one, to begin with, mankind had become unbelievably evil. Just something that we'd never seen before, something that we, we struggle with, that the biblical writer is, is, is maybe struggling to say, to communicate in a way that really lets us know how, how unbelievably evil they had become. Because they were, they were so evil that, that God had become grieved. Right? Scripture tells us he was grieved. He was filled with pain over having made mankind. And so he decides to send a flood upon the earth and, and undo mankind. So that's, that's a detail that's present in most of those narratives. Number two, the flood was worldwide. Meaning it wasn't just a place or a region. It was, it was worldwide. It was everywhere that this uh, culture knew about. It was worldwide. And representatives of all of the land animals were present on an ark, were saved, were preserved. Uh, a third detail is that in many of these narratives, there's a dove that's released from the boat in order to find out if there's dry ground. That appears again and again and again. Uh, number four, when the flood was over, the survivors, the people who were saved from the flood, they come down from a mountaintop in order to repopulate the world. And fifth... A detail that shows up over and over again is, is the protagonist's name, the hero's name in these, narrat in these narratives is often a variant of the name Noah. And I have no idea if I'm pronouncing these right, but there's variants such as Nu, Nuwa, Na, Nus, and Na. And there's some others that I really couldn't even give a shot at. But those sound a lot like Noah, Right. Well, the obvious question is, is why are these details consistent in so many of these narratives about a worldwide flood? And, and my answer, and I think the answer, is that these, these cultures all tell about this worldwide flood because it happened. It really happened. And, and when we come to Scripture and we come across things that sound far-fetched, which a lot in Scripture is far-fetched, that's what we call miracles, right? They really happened. And this flood really happened, and Noah really built an ark. So keep that at the, the base of your mind as we talk about this, as you talk about it later, as you teach your children about it. This really happened. Now, the, the, the question this morning is, is this. What does, God, what does God want us to learn, you and me? What does he want us to learn from this true event? Right? There's a whole lot to be learned, but, but what are some of the main things that God wants us to, to take away? And to begin with, we, we should certainly note that the the impetus for the flood was mankind's dark penchant for evil. It's scary when you think about it and you begin to imagine what things must have been like. The Bible describes it this way in Genesis chapter 6. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. It's, it's doing its very best to say this was a problem that was pervasive all the time. Every thought, ongoing. It was a, an ongoing problem. And just in case that wasn't clear enough, God repeated himself a few verses later. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence. Because of them, I am going, I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. 
There was no kindness in these people. There, there was no compassion. Unless they could hurt somebody or, or take advantage of somebody or revel in perversion, they just weren't interested. They had something else on their mind. In those days, life was cheap and honor despised. It's really a time that is not fun to imagine, and it's, it's terrifying to think about living in a time where man's thoughts were evil all the time. That's, that's scary. And we can hear echoes, and we can kind of see remnants of that kind of behavior or situation throughout human history. I mean, if you, if you pay attention to what's happened on the earth, you can see these types of things happen. And they're like echoes of what it must have been like in the days of Noah. Just in this past century, in the 20th century, we had Hitler's Nazi Germany. We had Stalin's communist Russia. Mao's murderous China. We had Pol Pot's Cambodia with the killing fields. And we have the Kim family's North Korea. And those that I, that I mentioned, those, those were portions of or maybe even entire societies that considered others to be worthless, uh, completely disposable. Millions and millions and millions of people were killed out of hatred or out of fear or out of the desire to have power, out of the desire to control. Those were evil, certainly. And even in our own country, a land dedicated to, to freedom and dignity, at least in our, in our, in our uh, greatest aspirations, the USA has, has instigated some pretty terrible things like the Trail of Tears, where we forced Native Americans to walk hundreds and hundreds of miles while many of them died. We had generations of slavery in the United States. We had the KKK in the past century. And that doesn't even begin to account for all of the millions of precious children who have been killed through legal abortions in the past five decades. Now, if you imagine all of that together, all of those societies, all of those evil things, all those wicked behaviors, if you imagine all of that together, that's what it seems like the culture was in Noah's day. Only evil all the time. A horrendous situation. Anybody who had a trace of decency just, just didn't stand a chance. Honest folks were either totally corrupted or they were killed. Because morality was not to be tolerated. Morality was not to be tolerated because morality, it made people just too uncomfortable. It does, and that happens today. Morality in one person makes somebody else feel uncomfortable. That's what we hear. You know, still today, the existence of morality, it, 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 prompts, it prompts the immoral uh, to cynically ask, you know, who, who, made, who made you God to judge me? Or, or, or who made you, God, to tell me what's moral and what isn't, right? Who are you to say so? People didn't even think in terms of, of right and wrong. That wasn't a, a concept in their minds. They were just trying to get by or, or they were trying to fit in. Because if they didn't fit in, then things got scary in a big old hurry, right? And, and, and there was this one weirdo guy. That's what I like to think about Noah. There was this one weird old guy who just refused to fit in. He said, I see how things are, but that's not how I'm going to be. Right? In an unbelievably villainous world, this man, Noah, was unquestionably virtuous. We see in Scripture that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And we find some explanation to, to, to why that was here in just a, a few minutes. Now, to be found in God's favor is, is noteworthy for anyone during any time, any time of human history. To be found in God's favor is an enormous thing. And the situation, it begs the question, what, what was it about Noah that caused him to be found in God's favor? What, what made him stand out so dramatically? And, and at least partially to answer that is, is Noah was different because he walked with God which is something that nobody else in the society apparently did. Noah walked in God while everybody else was following evil all the time. And we find some explanation to, to what Noah was like in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Quote, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, 
and he walked faithfully with God. Right? He was, he was righteous, he was blameless among his people, and he walked faithfully with God. So what does it mean that he walked faithfully with God? How do, how do we understand what that was like? What was he doing? I mean, is it, is it literally speaking? Is it spiritual? Is it figuratively speaking? Well, the, the most basic answer is, is that it means he lived his life with God. He lived his life with God. He, he didn't just give God Sundays or weekends or, or an hour here or there. It means that, that everywhere he went, he stayed next to God. He carried God and God's word and whatever God told him, he carried that in his heart. You see, Noah, he didn't only believe that God existed, which made him stand out in and of itself, but he also lived as though God cared deeply for him and that God was interested in every aspect of his life. Not just the broad strokes or just this, this, this broad general idea, but God cared about every little bit of Noah's life. And he must have made a prayerful decision to, to follow God because nobody else was doing that. I mean, this isn't something that he stumbled across accidentally. He had to think about it and he had to say, I'm not going to do what they're doing. I'm going to do what God is telling me to do. Right? It was a prayerful decision. And he taught his family to do likewise. Once God chose him, once God chose Noah to, to build the ark, we're repeatedly told, quote, Noah did all that God commanded him. All. Noah did all that God commanded him. We see that in chapter 6, verse 22, and again in chapter 7, and verse 5, and again in verse 19, and once again in verse 16. We're supposed to get this point. Noah did everything. He did all that God commanded him. Well, that's what we got to do. That's what we're called to do too, right? We're supposed to do all that God tells us to do. Whatever God told Noah to do, that's exactly what he did. E even when the instructions seemed crazy, Noah still obeyed. And his instructions from God, they certainly did seem crazy. Have no doubt, they were outlandish. It was, it was just crazy sounding. I mean, this is important. Listen to what we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It says that by faith, Noah, when, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. He got instructions and learned about things that were were not able, he was not able to imagine. They were things that he had not seen, and yet he went ahead and built the ark as God told him to do. And see, if you're going to walk with God, you've got to be willing to follow part of the way. No, that's not what I meant to say. You've got to be willing to follow most of the way, most of the time. Boy, that's not right either. No, if you're going to follow God, you've got to do it all the way. You've got to follow what God tells you to do. I have to do that. You have to do that. That is part of our instructions. And if you do that all the way, then you should expect people around you are going to tell you stuff like, man, you're crazy. You don't make sense. Why are you doing that? That's, that's ridiculous. You know, you're, you're, you're injuring your family. You're, 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 you're investing in things that are silly. People are going to tell you you're crazy. And you'll end up making choices that nobody else would make. You'll, you'll choose not to take advantage of other people when opportunity is right in front of you. You'll choose to sacrifice, to be useful to other people. You'll choose, to, to, you'll choose not to, to maybe attend this bar or attend that party or to live in sinful arrangements with a boyfriend or girlfriend. You'll make choices, your everyday life choices, based on what God has told us to do and what he's told us not to do. And people are going to think, man, you're crazy. I imagine that people around Noah laughed at him. And I say I, had to, I have to imagine that because we're not told that in detail in the book of Genesis. I, I imagine that they taunted him as well. I mean, for Pete's sake, he's building a huge box of a boat out in the middle of, of nowhere for a purpose that nobody can, can imagine. And, and when he explains it, it doesn't seem to make any sense. You know, it's a pretty safe bet that people laughed and then after they laughed, he goes on to tell them, he says, God's angry with you. And then he reminds them uh, of their immorality and their selfishness and the evil that's going on all around them. You see, the ark, it, it was an imposing reminder of God's condemnation. Think about that. The bigger the ark got, the more of, a, of an imposing reminder it was of what God had said was going to happen. And you know, when people find themselves judged or when they feel condemned, they tend to do more than just laugh, don't they? In fact, they tend to get a little bit nasty. 
sometimes if they feel like you're judging them or that somebody is condemning them. And that's what Jesus indicated we will face if we take our faith seriously. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, like Noah, who were before you. Now, now why would people persecute the followers of Christ? Sometimes we, we uh, earnestly think that or ask that. Why? why? Why does anybody, what does anybody have against me or us? I mean, we're not trying to hurt anybody. In fact, as far as I know about all of you and Christians that I know, we're trying to help people. So, so why? Why would we be persecuted? Well, there may be a lot of reasons, but part of it is that if we live as God commands us to, then our lives, our actions are an imposing reminder of the condemnation that's coming to people who live in immorality and selfishness. Our lives are not anything like the ark that stood 100 cubits or 300 cubits. i got to get that detail right. I think it was 300. But, but, but our lives can be an imposing reminder to people around us that God has said there's a certain way we're supposed to live. And if we don't, then there's consequences. Paul told the Christians of his day, we are the smell of death to those who are perishing. Yikes. We are the smell of death I mean, as I've walked around here today, most of y'all smell okay. All right, there's a few teenage boys who need some help, but the smell of death, that is a dramatic statement. Why would we be the smell of death to those who are perishing? Well, it's, it's like the diligent student who, who pays attention and studies her notes conscientiously. And when the test is given, she scores an A+. Plus. But her meritorious performance, it usually doesn't make her the most popular kid in her class, does it? Why is that? Why is that? Well, well it's, it's her GPA. You know, her, her, her ongoing, uh, her, her, her good performance and GPA is an ongoing reminder of what everybody else could have achieved if they'd only disciplined themselves. See, regardless of any innate intelligence or whether we're rich or poor or whether we're influential or powerless, educated or not, we are all able and expected to hear and follow God. We're all equally able of following God, regardless of any of those other factors. And so when somebody is seen to be following God, and it is contrasted with people who are not following God, then the person who's following God is an imposing reminder of judgment that's coming. That's one of the reasons Christians are persecuted if they actually live the way Jesus calls us to live. We're told this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without, without excuse. Now thinking about that same student I mentioned, what, what if she not only achieved her A+, plus, but what if she also routinely and confidently told her classmates how they needed to change, and what they needed to do to get a better grade, and, and warning them that there was... A test coming up, right? She didn't only perform well, but she's reminding them of what they need to do. That makes her less popular, doesn't it? Well, the same thing is true for us as Christians. If we're living like God is, is calling us to live, and if we're reminding people that there's a coming judgment, that's going to make some people unhappy with us. It's going to make some people furious at us. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. This is a detail we learn in the New Testament that, that isn't language that's present in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. He was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't just a ship builder, a sea right, which is what that last name means. He wasn't just a ship builder. He was a preacher. He was a, a prophet. He was a clarion of judgment. He verbally told folks what was needed and what was going to happen if they obeyed, if they didn't obey. And so it's really worth noting that, that God had not yet fully given up on these people. He, he hadn't. He hadn't fully given up on these people. Surely 
The ark would have been a major tourist attraction. Imagine that. You hear about this thing being built over here, and, and people would have come from hundreds, maybe hundreds of miles away to, to see this weird thing happening out in the wilderness and see this strange guy who's talking about God and lives differently than everybody else. They would have come. And when people came, Noah himself, his life, his actions, what he was building, it was a reminder of the same message, you know, repent, change. You've got to see God because there's this flood coming. And if you don't change, you're going to perish in that flood. You're going to drown. And even when the ark was completed, some of y'all will not have noticed this before, but even when the ark was completed and Noah and the animals, they were all on board the ark, even after all that happened, God still waited seven more days. Genesis chapter 7 verse 10 tells us that God waited those days. It says, after the seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth. After, what it's, saying, what it's saying is after Noah and his family were on there, and after all the animals were in there, then the seven more days passed. And remember, please, that Noah built this ark over decades. So people had a long time to see this warning and to hear uh, his call, his, his, his messages of, of righteousness. And then there were seven more days right at the end. Now you might say, wait a minute, are you trying to tell me that God still might have saved those people during those seven days? And yes, that's what I'm suggesting. I, I don't know that for a fact, but yes, that's what I'm suggesting. God still may have saved those people. I mean, I have a hard time imagining any other explanation for those seven days. Some other explanation may exist, but it's hard to imagine what it would have been. Why wait that final seven days? L let's recall together the details about Jonah and the big fish or the whale or whichever way you want to call it. Remember that God wanted Jonah to go to a city called Nineveh. He wanted him to go there and he wanted to declare that God's destruction and his, his condemnation, his destruction was going to come upon their city if they didn't repent. And that if they didn't repent part is hugely important to what God's mission for Jonah was. But you may remember Jonah didn't like Nineveh. He hated Nineveh. And so instead of going to Nineveh this direction, he got on a ship to go as far away as he could, all the way to a place called Tarshish. Right? He said, I don't like them. I don't want to go give them this message of, of redemption. So I'm going to go this way. And, and there was this big encounter with a, a storm and he was cast overboard. And then he spent three days inside the belly of this big beast. And he decides, you know what, maybe I'm going to go to Nineveh, right? It's amazing how, how much it takes sometimes. But he goes, he goes to Nineveh, and he spends three more days. Three days comes up a lot. He spends three days traveling throughout the city of Nineveh, and he tells them that message. He says, you've got you've to change. And you know what they did? They were so frightened by God's message that Jonah delivered that they, they, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repented, and they humbled themselves and God saved them. He spared them. You see, God didn't want to destroy Nineveh. Jonah was a pretty big fan of the idea, but God didn't want to destroy Nineveh. No, he wanted them to change. But you know what? In the days of Noah, when he was preaching righteousness, nobody, nobody fasted, nobody repented, nobody said, you know what, you're right. Nobody said, hey, that's a scary thing you're telling me. I'm going to pay attention. Nobody did that. Apparently they were just too far gone, or maybe they were just too far corrupted. Because even with Noah's warning and with the ark standing there as a, as a testimony of God's intentions, nobody changed. And I can visualize all the people staying there mocking Noah and looking up at the sky and saying, I don't feel any rain. I don't see any clouds. You're, you're, you're just nuts, Noah. They ignored the warnings because they refused to believe God. People are doing the exact same thing today. People will say, yeah, that's a scary message and a beautiful message that you're giving. But you know what? I, I don't believe it because I just don't believe in the God you're telling me about. That is the problem of our culture today. It's not that they're taking issue with the facts we're presenting. They're just saying, I don't believe in the God who gave you the message that you're claiming. And that reaction is as old as mankind. It's not really new today. It's in new uh, manifestations, but it's not new Scripture tells us the following. In the last days, some people won't think about anything except their own selfish desires. They will make fun of you and say, didn't your Lord promise to come back? Yet the first leaders have already died and the world hasn't changed a bit. They will say this because they want to forget that long ago the heavens and earth were made at God's command. 
The earth came out of water and was made from water. Later it was destroyed by the waters of a mighty flood. But God has commanded the present heavens and earth to remain until the day of judgment. Then they will be set on fire and ungodly people will be destroyed. The people in Noah's day, they couldn't see the rain and they just didn't want to change. And the fate of, of many at the end of time is going to be the same as it was in the days of Noah. There will be judgment. There will be destruction. This time not at the hands of a worldwide flood, but with fire of some kind. And people will have no excuse on the day of judgment. People will probably come up with all kinds of clever excuses to try, but no excuse is going to work on the day of judgment. Nothing that comes out of the mind of man, that is. You know, for something like a hundred years while the ark was constructed, th those people, they had innumerable chances to change. And God didn't want them to perish. And those two things should have come together and re re uh, um, resulted in people not being destroyed, but it didn't. I mean, these were God's own beloved creations. He didn't want them to perish. The same is true today. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. As I was studying all of the biblical passages that refer to the flood, I observed that each of them spoke of man's evil sin and God's condemnation. Those always go together. Every single passage talks about that except one. Except one. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, this is what we read. We're told God waited patiently. There's that patience I just talked about. God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every other passage about the flood, it spoke of judgment with condemnation. But this one, this one speaks of hope with salvation. Condemnation doesn't have to be our fate. Salvation is a gift that's offered to me and to you. And I, I wonder why the difference why the difference? In 1 Peter, Noah's ark is compared to Jesus. The ark was a shelter for those saved. And it was built of, of wood and it had only one door. There was only one way in and there was only one way out. But the Bible, it shares the good news. The New Testament shares the good news of, of, of Jesus Christ, that Jesus as well has built a shelter for us. Not an ark, but a church. You know, not a building, a physical place like the one we're in right here, but the church, meaning the body of believers who meet together to worship and praise God. That is our shelter from the storm. And that church is built upon the wood of Calvary's cross. And the church of Christ, meaning Jesus Christ's church, it has only one door. And that door is Jesus. Consider these intriguing comparisons as I conclude, Noah held a hammer in his hands. Jesus absorbed the blows of a hammer upon his hands. Noah built with wood while Jesus was pinned to wood. Noah constructed a door, but Jesus said, I am the door. Noah covered the ark with a tar-like pitch, but Jesus has covered us with his blood, giving us salvation from condemnation. The primary lesson out of so many, the primary lesson to be learned from Noah and the flood is, is this. There is a coming judgment, but there's also salvation. We don't have to be terrified because we have a future promised to us by God through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he, he made for us on the cross. We know that there's salvation available to us and there's salvation available to everybody else. And a big part of what we're supposed to do is go out and tell people, like Noah did, there's condemnation coming, there's destruction coming, but God has given you a beautiful way and a beautiful life that leads unto salvation instead. 
There will be a time when God's long suffering, his patience with mankind's habit of, of sin is simply going to run out. I don't know when it's going to come, but when it does comes, when it does come, you, you uh, will you be in it? Will, will you be in it or, or, or will you be outside of God's protective shelter, his church? Will you be in it or will you be out of it? Will you be, will you be comforted by what God has done to provide for you? Or you, will you be wishing that you had made a different decision? Because those who are outside of God's church and outside of the blood of Jesus Christ are going to be damned to face destruction. And believe it or not, the choice is absolutely yours. And it's everybody else's too. The choice is theirs. And so I say to you, and please won't you see to, say to others, please choose God's salvation. It's available to you. If you're ready for God's salvation, if you want to become a Christian today, please come forward as we stand and sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, Flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, hallowed is your name. You are the great I am, and we Assemble today to worship you, to sing songs of praise, to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we ask thee, Lord, if those things that we've done are acceptable in your sight. We ask thee if you'll go with us now as we leave this building, this assembly. If you'll be with us, guide us throughout our lives, give us the direction that we need. Allow us to become better Christians, Lord, because we know that that day of judgment is coming. And that we want, above all else, to be ready for that judgment, to answer your call, and to be one of your chosen, to live in paradise and heaven with you forever. We ask thee, Lord, as we face sin or temptation, Lord, as we face those temptations in our life, give us the strength to resist it. And when we do fall to sin, we ask thee if you'll give us the strength to come to you with a repentant heart and ask forgiveness. Lord, keep us safe throughout the week. Be with our loved ones, those of our number who are sick, ailing, or grieving. Wherefore we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I mean, it's so useful, for example, that, but say if you can't make it, but you really, really want to go, you know, wherever you're at, maybe, well, you're, maybe you're at a fourth of game, you can even just fourth your plan. Yeah, yeah. We need to talk the game and uh, make it a, an evangelical thing. What are you talking about? You got to move up the you got to have one for you. You need to do something where you can make it 1080. It is 1080. No, it's not. It's, it's going out of 1080, but it's the internet. I don't know what's going on. I was down there and it only put me on. I can only set it all the way up to 1020. That's the internet, it's not us. We're outputting at 1080p. That's weird. Yeah, I was just sitting there like, well, what the world? This man can go on 720 I was just sitting there saying this. You wouldn't, you wouldn't notice a bit of difference on a screen as small as these. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, I was just like, boy, well, what's that man doing? He's taking, you know, putting. 1020p, you know, I know that. Don't make put on 1080p. He got throttled back to um, standard definition for a while because our internet slowed down. Oh, 480p? 480p. Oh, man. Oh, was it that? Yeah, I remember that one time because I remember when I went to saw on the live stream, it was like 360. I remember that like one time it was only putting on 360p. Because he had, I guess that's Three, the way he put 360p. It. Well, you know me. 360p or whatever, you know. I remember that. How you doing, bud? 